started. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dana Jay with Henry Ford Health System, and welcome to this media briefing. We are super, super excited about it because not only do we have an adorable baby, we also have her amazing mom and her amazing dad and her amazing doctors. So we're super excited that you were able to um, join us today. We're going to be sharing this really special COVID-19 patient story that has a positive and happy ending. Um, this first half of the briefing will be moderated by Dr. Lisa Allen Spock, who will start by providing a case overview. She will introduce our patient and her family, as well as some of the members of the clinical team. And once that concludes, we'll take your questions in the chat, sense, uh, chat section. Um, just FYI, if you want to start putting them there, I'll do my best to get to them in the order in which um, I receive them. Um, and I will actually be doing the asking of the questions because of the way of our setup is today. So if you could um, just be nice and clear in your question, that would be fantastic. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lisa Allenstock. Doctor. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm here to share this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Just it's on? Okay. So thank you so much. I'm here to uh, share this amazing story of Jacqueline who uh, went into Wyandotte Hospital on November 20th. She went there with very typical COVID symptoms that we're all aware of. Um, she had cough and fever, shortness of breath, headache, and nausea. Her COVID swab was positive and she was 36 weeks pregnant with her first baby. She was admitted to the hospital at Wyandotte and received excellent immediate care with remdesivir, steroids, and heparin, a blood thinner. After five days in the hospital, she developed severe hypertension, signs of preeclampsia, and underwent induction of labor. And on November 27th, Jacqueline gave birth to a healthy baby girl who we'll all get to meet. Unfortunately, within two days, her breathing worsened, requiring oxygen, and her chest x-ray showed typical features of COVID-related pneumonia. This was 10 days after her presenting symptoms, which is the typical time frame when we see the overwhelming inflammatory response that some individuals have to COVID. She then got convalescent plasma infusions twice, but her breathing deteriorated and she required a ventilator and high amounts of oxygen to keep her uh, blood oxygen levels normal. And she also required high amounts of sedation and paralysis. On December 8th, she was transferred to our main hospital for consideration of ECMO, who my, which my partner will describe. Um, and, and she went on to need this therapy within just a few days. Our lung transplant team began the evaluation at that point with very careful attention, assuring that she was no longer carrying the COVID virus and that her other organ systems were working well. We waited to see if her lungs would improve on their own, but it became very apparent that no recovery was possible as she continued to deteriorate. And on January 6th, she was placed on the UNOS transplant list. Just 10 days later, she received bilateral lungs and she has made a record breaking recovery. Within a few weeks, she was completely off of the ventilator and discharged from the hospital in less than a month, not wearing any oxygen. As you will hear, she is home with her family and her new baby and she is doing so well. Her life has changed. She remains COVID safe and requires multiple medications that are taken at regular intervals. She exercises daily and follows regularly with our transplant team. Jacqueline is really an inspiration to all of us with her positive attitude and constant smile. And we are so grateful that she has done so amazingly well with her transplant. So I would like to introduce my partner, uh, Dr. Koba, who is going to talk a bit about uh, her ECMO therapy and what she went through as she was waiting for lung transplant. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Jacqueline was uh, at Henry Ford Hospital, transferred on a ventilator, uh, requiring significant support on the ventilator, which we see with COVID. 
uh, our ECMO team was called to for evaluation given the amount of oxygen requirements and mechanical support that Jacqueline was requiring at the time while getting all the treatment for COVID that we give. Uh, things that we look for specifically when we're considering ECMO, ECMO is a heart lung machine that we use to provide oxygen to the blood um, in hopes for the lungs to recover after a bad infection like COVID. Um, we uh, do this in the ICU and we have um, ECMO maintained in our cardiovascular ICU and that's where we, uh, Jacqueline was at uh, for many days. Uh, things that we look for when we're putting a patient on ECMO is how the other organs are doing, how are the kidneys doing, how's the heart, how's the liver. Uh, we do worry about some of the complications related to being on a heart lung machine, um, but with hopes of having the lungs recover uh, with time. In Jacqueline's case, uh, the lungs did not recover. And once we noticed that that was not gonna be an option, the lungs being able to recover, the lung transplant team was involved. And as my partner had talked about, uh, was placed on the lung transplant list. While on the lung transplant list, we still had to wait um, for a, a pair of lungs. And that required still persisting on the, the ECMO machine. The ECMO machine, things we worry about why it's, you know, it's difficult and requires a high uh, skill level of resource training from nurses, perfusionists, um, advanced providers, um, and ICU physicians to kind of care for a patient that's on ECMO. Um, so with our physical therapy team and our respiratory therapy team as well. And these are the things that we were keep continuing doing uh, while we were waiting for uh, the lung transplant um, match. Great. Thank you so much. Good. So I think I'd now really like to introduce Jacqueline and her baby and husband and just have them say a few words about uh, sort of what she's doing right now and how she's feeling. Hi. So I'm home now with Ricky and my baby. Her name is Mia Rose. Um, and I feel like I'm doing great. I still go to pulmonary rehab to help build my strength and keep my lungs working. And I do that four days a week. Um, but other than that, we just do normal things while staying at home and staying safe because that's the most important, especially right now, since we're only about two months post-surgery. So that's really what we're doing. That's great. Thanks so much. I know that um, you were in the hospital for a really long time, and um, I know that you made such a fast recovery. I mean, you really did amazing. I know that we also pay a lot of attention to the team and your team. So maybe you could just say a few words about what, you know, who has helped you with all of this and your family support. So in terms of the hospital, it's hard to even put into words what a great experience I had for having to be there. Um, I had the best team, the nurses, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, the surgeons, down to the environmental service um, department and the food service. They would come in and check on me and ask how I was doing and ask to see pictures of Mia. Um, it made it so that even though I was just begging to go home. It was sad to have to leave everyone because everyone at the hospital was truly amazing. I just, I couldn't pick one person because everyone helped me, whether it was just brushing out my hair or making sure I was comfortable or making sure I was knowledgeable on everything that was going on. So in terms of the hospital, it was just amazing. I've never had to stay in the hospital but I can assure you this is the only one I'm going to um, if I ever have to go back. And friends and family, I know I have a lot of friends and family and I know how amazing they are, but the things that they were doing, especially when I call it asleep, when I was asleep and I didn't know what was going on. And then I wake up and I find out it's just heartwarming and it 
was one of the only times I got emotional just reading about my story and all of the people donating and all of my friends doing fundraisers and making food to bring to my family and buying me a gifts and making sure she was taken care of. Um, that was a very stressful time for my friends and family and they just supported me through the whole thing and currently. Great. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if we have, if you have some words to say, it sounds like uh, <laughs> you've got your hands Jack, full. Did a, but... <laughs> did a great job. I mean, the, my family was, was huge. Yeah. That's great. Wonderful. Thanks. So I'm not sure if we have some questions uh, that we can try to answer. We sure do, Dr. Allen-Spock. Actually, um, I'm going to sort of do something a little funny, but for the benefit of our friends in the media, can we go down the line and will each of you please say your name and spell it so that they know they have it spelled correctly in their publication? Sure. Uh, Victor Koba, C-O-B as in boy, A, and the uh, ECMO Medical Director and the uh, ICU physician. And Dr. Koba is an MD. MD, yes. So I'm Dr. Lisa Allenspach. It's spelled A-L-L-E-N-S-P-A-C-H, MD. And I'm the medical director of the lung transplant program and uh, representing the lung transplant program, but also Dr. Hassan Nemi, who could not be here right now. He's in the OR, uh, was uh, instrumental in all of this too. I'm Jacqueline or Jackie Dennis, D-E-N-N-I-S. And I'm just a long <laughs> uh, Ricky Dennis, uh, Jacqueline's husband. In common spelling on both Ricky and, and Jackie, correct? J-A-C-K-I-E and Ricky, R-I-C-K-Y. And yeah. Mia is M-I-A. Yep. Rose, R-O-S-E, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, very good. We just want to make sure we get you represented accurately. All right, our first question is coming from um, M. Marini at the Detroit Free Press um, asking, Jackie, how are you feeling now? How has your recovery been? And what was the reunion like when you first met Mia? Or your, I guess it wasn't your, I guess you met her after she was born, but when you were reunited with her, um, what was that like for you? So currently I feel amazing. Um, I feel actually pretty normal, you know, building strength, walking around, everything. You know, things are still a little hard, maybe taking too many steps, things like that, going up and down the stairs. But generally speaking, I can do almost everything I want to besides pick up Mia just yet. Um, with the sternal precautions for my chest bone, I'm not allowed to lift anything heavier than 10 pounds just yet. But after about three months, I should be able to pick her up. So, you know, um, I'm, yeah, I'm just feeling really good. I'm really grateful. So even emotionally, I feel as if I'm dealing very well with it and everything. And then what was the other question? Uh, what was it like when you were reuniting with Mia? Oh, reuniting with Mia. So actually, um, because again, how amazing the transplant team and everyone at the hospital was, they went through a bunch of hoops to figure out how it would be safest for me to meet Mia while I was still in the hospital. So that was amazing. Um, Ricky got to bring her up and this was when I still couldn't talk or anything and I couldn't lift her. I was still weak, but it was just great to actually see her because even after she was born, things were really foggy. And I was getting so sick so fast that it was hard to remember, you know, I know what she looks like and they put up a ton of pictures for me. Nurses put up pictures of her, Ricky put up pictures of her. So um, I was able to FaceTime her and see her, but actually seeing her and getting her put in my arms was just amazing. Wonderful, thank you, Jackie. Um, the next question is for Dr. Allen Spack. So Dr. Allenspeck, uh, Ed White is asking, can you please talk about the impact of COVID on Jackie's lungs? Uh, he says it was obviously very extreme. Is that rare? And um, his question continues, did the pregnancy have a role in her lungs condition? 
So we know that um, just as Jackie experienced that sometimes people can have the typical symptoms and many recover, but a smaller fraction will go on to have a very intense infl inflammatory response to the virus, which particularly strikes the lungs. Um, and this tends to happen in people who have higher risk situations, although not always. Um, and one of those risk factors can be if people have medicines they're taking that uh, suppress their immune system. Another risk factor is in uh, Jacqueline's situation is pregnancy. And so certainly her pregnancy caused her to have a heightened risk of developing this inflammatory syndrome that led to lung failure. Um, I think it was very, very clear from looking at her x-rays and CAT scans and then all sorts of measures that we do in the ICU that her lungs were uh, completely destroyed by this inflammatory response to the virus. Um, and without transplant, she would not have been able to, to be alive. Wonderful, thank you. Um, our next question comes from Dr. Deanna Lights at WWJ and Deanna asks, how damaged were Jackie's lungs from COVID compared to other lungs that you transplant? So I think that her situation was probably as severe as anyone that we transplant. So most individuals um, that are undergoing lung transplant have had a chronic illness. So they have had something that for uh, typically years has destroyed their lung. And oftentimes for lung transplant, they're called from home uh, on high amounts of oxygen, but still able to walk, still able to perform some of their activities. Um, in Jacqueline's situation, I think her lung damage was um, as severe as, as we've ever seen leading into transplant. Um, and that, that's um, certainly supported by the fact that she required a step beyond using even a mechanical ventilator, but having to be on ECMO in order to bypass the lungs and make sure that she had enough oxygen to sustain herself until she was transplanted. Thank you, Dr. Ellensbeck. And actually, um, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Koba. Dr. Koba, can you talk a little bit about why ECMO has become so critical in COVID cases at, um, and what exactly, or what, how rare of a resource it is? So ECMO um, is, like we talked about, is, is a heart-lung machine providing oxygen for the blood um, while the lungs are, are waiting to recover. Uh, it is a limited resource that's provided uh, by a limited number of centers. COVID uh, has been one of the uh, disease process that you know, has kind of expanded the use of ECMO. Uh, we've used ECMO before for other virus infections, influenza, uh, but with COVID, it's uh, definitely different. And that's, I think that's what a lot of the ECMO centers have been finding. Um, it's not just a respiratory illness. Sometimes there are a lot of other complications that we worry about that can be from heart, uh, the liver, the kidneys, uh, bleeding or clotting, uh, many different things like that, that we, that we see, um, and requires a full, full resource team, um, at an ECMO center to provide that high level of, of care that's required. Well, we did ask, have someone ask about the spelling of ECMO. It's E-C-M-O, but does that um, stand for anything that we should know about? Or can you tell us what that stands for? It, it stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, and that's the machine that puts together the support and pumps the blood as well as adding oxygen to it. And it's E-C-M-O, correct. Thank you very much. Folks, uh, go ahead and put your questions in the chat for me um, if there's if you have them and please identify yourself according to, um, identify your outlet for me too as well. Ricky, I know you're a man of few words, but we'd love to hear from you as well. What were these, what were the past few months like for you with a brand new baby at home and your, and your wife in the hospital that you had to have been very concerned. Uh, there's really no words you can put put to it, right? And your wife's, you know, fighting for her life. You got a new baby at home. Just, it was tough. Thank you. Uh, this is your first first child? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Ricky. Sorry to put you on the spot like that. I know it's, it's um, I know it's gotta be pretty emotional for you. 
Um, you know, Jackie, when you come through this, is there is there anything? Do you think much about your donors, donor, the donor family, where your lungs came from? Anything that you would like folks to know about organ donation? Um, I do think about it, and we talked about it pretty soon after I woke up and I was more coherent. I didn't really know how the whole donor thing worked because this is just new territory for me. So I had asked Ricky and he told me a little bit about what he learned and, you know, I would just, if they ever wanted to meet us or hear anything about us, I would totally be open to that. I would tell them that I'm so sorry, but at the same time, I'm so grateful. Um, they had to suffer whomever this is a huge loss for me to be able to be here with my child and my husband. So it is amazing it is, as it is, it's still a really sad situation that someone else had to go through something terrible so that I could be here with my family. Very good, thank you so much. And um, for the panel, anybody who, who would like to answer, you know, we're, we're here we are at the one year anniversary-ish of COVID in the United States, we obviously have um, a very happy story that we're we're so proud to tell. But what would you say to folks at home now who are you know ready to come out of their their COVID and their quarantine slumber, et cetera, um, to to keep in mind as we continue um, to come out of this pandemic? I mean, I don't blame anyone for wanting that or anyone for feeling how they feel about COVID. You know. I've always believed and known that I could get it, but I would have never in a million years thought that I would need a double lung transplant at 31. So, you know, it was hard to be stuck in a hospital and it's also hard to be stuck at home. So I understand people wanting to get out. You just have to do what's safe for you. It's safer for me to stay home and wear a mask around literally everyone, but some people, they feel safe going out and either wearing a mask, not wearing a mask. It's just a personal kind of preference, I feel like, and no one can be blamed for what they want. Yeah, sure. So I think one thing that's really important that I know Dr. Coba and I feel every day, and that is that COVID is still with us. So we still have people in the ICU, people on ventilators, um, and by no means are we out of this pandemic. So I think that one really clear message is that masks work and that everyone should be wearing a mask. I think it's really important to help save lives, not only your own, but other people around you. Um, and then I'll give a pitch for the vaccine. Um, I think that uh, more and more people are becoming eligible and um, I'm sure we were both vaccinated. I know I was. And so I can really speak to that and really um, you know, tell everyone that I think all three vaccines are really effective. I would encourage everyone to be vaccinated uh, when your name comes up. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Leon Speck and, um, or Jackie, a couple of um, points of clarification. Um, Jackie, why were you induced? Was it because a combination of the preeclampsia uh, pre and the um, positive COVID test? I as I recall it, it was a lot like preeclampsia. My blood pressure shot up really high, really fast. And so I think that that was like the biggest push to get the baby out. Um, because before I had her, I had the symptoms, but they weren't nearly as bad as after I had her. Got it. Okay. And Dr. Ellen Spack, if you could um, clarify for us, why did we do a double lung transplantation rather than a single lung? So uh, for some individuals, um, a single lung transplant is absolutely works great. In general, for younger individuals, uh, we prefer to do a, a double lung transplant over a single lung transplant. And in people who are critically ill on ECMO, uh, we usually always put double lungs in those individuals just because of pressures in the heart uh, and their overall a level of illness is just too high to be supported with just a one lung transplant. Very good. Have you seen an increase in need in organ donation due to COVID? Um, I think that the, the number of COVID related transplants that have occurred throughout the, the country are still relatively low. 
Um, I have a feeling as, as this is more uh, understood and established, we'll probably be offering more transplants for COVID. Currently, it's being done in people who are critically ill. So what we're trying to understand at this point in pulmonary medicine is if people will have permanent scarring uh, that they're left with after COVID and what the sequela of that will be. So will transplant be something that's needed as more of a chronic illness with COVID rather than just in this acute setting? And that yet we don't know and has not been done to this point. Thank you very much. And folks, um, once again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat now. Otherwise, we're going to begin to wrap up. And I'm going to thank you for all for joining us today, Dr. Kova, Dr. Ellen Sack, Jackie, Mia, and Ricky. Ricky, sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> I want to give you a big hug, but you know, we can't do that. That's against the rules right now. Um, so, oh, I do have another question from Ed White here before we go. Uh, what are the future risks for Jackie? What's reasonable for her to expect? And this Ed is with the Associated Press. So um, one of the uh, mandates after transplant is that everyone takes immunosuppressants or medicine to allow the lungs to be tolerated by the body. And these immunosuppressants are given for the rest of Jackie's life. And those medications in and of themselves have side effects associated. They tend to be more chronic side effects, things like high blood pressure, some, in some individuals, diabetes. And we pay particular attention to that, and sometimes that requires more medications. So for the average transplant recipient, um, one of the things that they deal with is a lot of medications, I'm sure Jackie feels that, that have to be given really at regular intervals to keep the lungs healthy and functioning well. But with that said, uh, we expect that she should be able to return to work to do things that she wants to do. Um, she'll exercise every day and breathe normally without oxygen. And we have many patients who are, you know, survivors at 10, 20 years after lung transplant at this point. So long-term survival is really very, very possible and likely. Thank you very much. Jackie, I do have another question for you. Uh, I understand you had you got some support from, from school. What was the, the theme that kept you going? Um, <laughs> bring back the fight. It's um, I, actually our cheerleading theme for competitive cheer this year. So it was funny. I was talking to the PT at the hospital. PT and OT were great as well. I forgot them. And I was telling her about cheerleading because I love it. And I love my coach that I coach with and the girls. And she made me a sign for my walker that said, bring back the fight. And the girls made me posters with pictures of them with the saying and they take a poster to their competitions that has it and they made sweatshirts. They're just so supportive and um, it's just amazing that, you know, it's led by my co-coach Danielle, but also the girls to have young girls just so caring and reach out. It's amazing. So just be a fighter. <laughs> Good job. And do you want to tell us which school you're with? Oh, I um, teach and coach at Huron High School in New Boston. Awesome. What do you teach? I'm a special education teacher and I mostly teach math. So algebra two and geometry, super fun. <laughs> very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So folks, seeing no other questions, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Nate, for my friends in television, would you go ahead and get a nice tight shot of baby Mia as she's sleeping there so nicely. Um, that way we won't have everybody sit awkwardly as we wrap things up. Thank you so much everybody for joining us today. Um, photos are and video, or excuse me, photos um, are available on henryford.com along with our news release. Um, they are courtesy of the Dennis family and Henry Ford Health System. There is video there as well, folks, if you need them um, after you get your shots of this adorable sleeping baby. Um, we'll just thank you for, for being with us and um, ask you to have a great afternoon. Jackie, Ricky, Dr. Ellen Sack, Dr. Koba, thank you so much. Thank you.